Hi, and welcome to our video on regulation in organisms. The last three videos looked at regulation at the cellular level, particularly with regard to gene expression and changes in gene expression. Now we're moving up a level and we're going to look at regulation in the organism more broadly. And that's why your photo should be here, because you are a well-regulated organism, so congratulations. The question we're going to look at in this video is how is organismal physiology controlled? We're going to look at homeostasis and what that means for an organism. We're going to look at physiological feedback mechanisms. And we're finally going to look at examples of physiology that point to common ancestry and divergence for different environmental requirements. Homeostasis is regulation. It's the regulation that takes place inside of an organism on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis. Whatever the time scales are, it's the net result of all of the processes that oscillate around whatever the set points are that we need in order to remain optimally functional, physiologically capable, and alive. This graph is showing us changes in our blood glucose levels over the course of a day. And we can see that sometimes it goes up, and sometimes it goes down, but we're always around a similar steady state condition. And as you know, that is a classic hallmark of negative feedback relationships. In order to understand what this looks like, particularly with regard to blood sugar, let's look at how this works in mammals. Consider the ideal condition for blood glucose as a set point. As that goes up, our bodies will release insulin, which is a hormone that causes us to pull glucose out of the bloodstream and store it in carbohydrates like glycogen for later use. This of course causes our blood glucose level to fall back down to that ideal set point. Over the course of the day, if we don't eat or as we're waiting to eat again, our blood glucose level will drop and this will cause the pancreas to release the hormone glucagon, which is going to have the opposite effect. It's going to take the stored glycogen that's inside of the cells of our body and convert it back into glucose and release it back into our bloodstream. Classic negative feedback relationship and a classic example of homeostasis in mammals. If we want one from plants, we can look at the action of stomates, the microscopic holes on the leaves of plants that are involved in regulating the concentrations of respiratory gases and water inside of the plant. It's good to think about ideal physiological set points when considering how this works. The ideal concentrations of oxygen and water vapor are necessary for the plant to carry out respiration and photosynthesis. As those concentrations rise above the set point, the stomates on the leaf will open and will cause those substances to leave the leaf, bringing the internal conditions of the plant back to the set point. Certainly this can go the other way as well, and as those concentrations fall below the set point, the stomates will then close, preventing those substances from leaving the leaf and causing them to rise back up again. Once again, we see the oscillation around this steady state condition, another classic example of negative feedback homeostasis. When looking at physiological regulation in organisms, we can also see examples of both common ancestry and adaptive divergence pretty much anywhere we look. The example I've chosen here is to look at how marine fish and freshwater fish regulate the amount of water inside of their bodies because it works in opposite ways. Marine fish are in hypertonic environments compared to the cells of their body. As a result, water is constantly being lost from the cells of the organism. In order to counteract this, marine fish have a variety of adaptations that help them tolerate existing in these hypertonic environments. And you can see some of them here. They'll drink a lot of seawater and actively transport ions through their gills, and they'll produce a very small amount of concentrated, very salty urine in order to counteract the amount of freshwater that's constantly being lost to their environment. Freshwater fish work in the opposite because they find themselves in the opposite type of environment. Freshwater is hypotonic compared to the fish, and so water is constantly moving into a freshwater fish, and the freshwater fish needs to eliminate it as a result. In order to do that, freshwater fish will produce a lot of very dilute urine, pretty much constantly, in order to give off a lot of the excess water that's entering into the system. These two types of regulatory strategies are exactly opposite because the constraints of the environments in which these two fish live have resulted in the evolution of these contrary osmoregulatory strategies. We can see a similar thing if we look at the production of nitrogenous waste in animals. Organisms that live in aquatic environments produce their nitrogenous waste as ammonia, which is incredibly toxic and needs to be heavily diluted. This is not a problem if you live in water because you're constantly taking in water, and so your urine can have a high concentration of water in order to dilute the very toxic ammonia that you're producing. 
Mammals can't do that. Our nitrogenous waste is urea, which is not as toxic as ammonia, and so as a result, it does not need to be diluted as much. This is advantageous for us as we do not live in water, so we do not have the kind of constant access to water that's necessary to dilute our urine as much as an aquatic animal does. An even more water-conserving nitrogenous waste strategy is found in birds and in reptiles in the production of uric acid, which is the least toxic nitrogenous waste, and as a result, it needs to be diluted the least, which is advantageous to any organism that has particularly limited access to water. The trade-offs as we move down this system is the amount of energy that we need to spend in our metabolism to convert the nitrogenous waste that's produced from the breakdown of proteins and amino acids into an acceptable form. Nitrogenous waste requires very little conversion in order to be turned into ammonia. So organisms that are able to dispose of their nitrogenous waste as ammonia need to spend very little energy converting it into that substance. As we go down to urea, we need to spend more energy. And then uric acid requires the most amount of energy in order to produce that particular form of nitrogenous waste. As always with evolution, we see both benefits to a particular strategy and trade-offs that are dictated by the requirements of the environment in which the organism lives. These were just a couple of examples of physiological regulation and how common ancestry and divergence play out in looking at them, but it's important for you not to stop here. You should take a moment right now and find as many other examples as you can of physiological feedback loops at work in yourself or in other organisms, regulatory commonalities that we see among different lineages, and regulatory divergences that we see as a result of different environments in which different animals live. Seriously, stop this video right now and just make a list of as many of these things as you can. The more you can do this, the better off you'll be at understanding how physiology results from feedback loops that are driven by the particulars of the evolutionary history of organisms. It's a good game to play, and I can't recommend it enough, but to keep going through it here would be a little redundant. Thanks so much for watching our video on organismal regulation. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how feedback loops allow for regulation of physiology in organisms. Make sure you can describe how evolution has resulted in physiological mechanisms that result from both common ancestry and divergence among organisms. And finally, make sure that you can provide as many examples as you can of items number one and two on this list. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.